Okay, let us begin um, the uh, last portion of the, this introductory le level, uh, introductory lecture. Um, we're going to look at uh, defining political philosophy and theory and ideology now. And the first question we might ask ourselves is, um, why well, study the thought of a bunch of mostly dead white guys? Um, a lot of people uh, who study political theory think that uh, uh, that uh, people who live in the past, sometimes thousands of years ago, mostly white guys are irrelevant in a um, currently multicultural world in which everything is modern. After all, we have iPads and flat screen TVs and stereo sets and things of, of that sort. How relevant can the ideas of a bunch of old guys be? Well, as I just explained, despite all the changes that are going on, um, uh, philosophy deals with uh, perennial questions. Uh, the questions remain the same. Uh, it's just the answers that uh, change uh, depending on um, circumstances. Um, the word philosophy itself comes from um, two Greek words, um, philia, which means to love, and sophia, which means w uh, wisdom. So a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. And philosophy today means um, a discipline which is concerned with the normative implications of political organization of behavior. That is, to put it another way, it's, uh, what, it asks the question of how should the state and society be organized and how should the citizens within uh, the state uh, behave. So normative means that uh, what should be. Um, it is uh, trying to determine what the s moral standards or what the uh, best possible standards would be for organizing society and um, uh, uh, determining how people should behave in society. A philosopher is um, an interesting kind of person because a philosopher is a lover of wisdom, which means their love of wisdom transcends all other concerns. Most people don't love wisdom uh, more than anything else. They love power, money, glory, comf glory, comfort, success, prestige. Most people pursue uh, material things. But the philosopher is a little different in that he or she um, uh, love of, of wisdom is so great that they will actually um, ignore um, uh, values or um, attributes that may come to them which would um, greatly benefit them. They're not really interested in whether something will give them comfort or will um, give them advantages. They're only look, interested in looking at things in a kind of dispassionate way in determining uh, the truth. As we find out when we study Socrates, Socrates, that his love of wisdom was so great, his love of truth was so great, that he even sacrificed his life in the name of truth. Uh, theory is a kind of related word. Uh, we sometimes sort of use them uh, interchangeably. Um, philosophy and theory, but they actually mean somewhat different things. Again, it's a word that comes from a Greek word, uh, theoria. I suppose that's how it's pronounced. I, uh, not being a Greek, I wouldn't know for sure. And it's the act of knowing or seeing with the inward eye of the mind. A theory is a model which ha helps us understand and explain reality. For Plato and Aristotle, um, Philosophy meant observing the world as it is. So a, a philosopher should be detached from the media political struggle and, and look at facts without distortion. A theory is something a philosopher uses, and so do we all use. There, there are sort of models that we have in our mind that helps us organize um, the data, the essential data that we're receiving.
For example, every day we hear about the economy. The economy is doing good. It's not so good. It's up. It's down. But yet you can't observe it um, in any kind of physical way because it's a model that we have in our minds where we put together a bunch of, uh, of um, behaviors and uh, we organize them and say that this explains how the economy is doing. Or we look at government, um, we talk about totalitarian governments, we talk about free governments, we talk about lawful governments. Um, these are all based on models that we have in our minds that we apply. Uh, so we deal with a lot of theories in this class. In fact, um, you're unable to get through life yourself without having theories about things. Just like you have a theory about this college, you have a theory about this class, you have a theory about what you'll learn from your books. Uh, otherwise, you couldn't do anything. Every, uh, all reality would just be disorganized events. You, you put reality together in some sort of a theory, which helps describe and, and, and explain things and, and predict what's going to happen. Now, the difference between a philosopher and an ideologue, which we'll look at in a minute, is that a philosopher understands there's no final answer to any of these eternal questions. Um, it's not like a math course where 2 plus 2 will always equal 4. Um, one of the frustrating aspects of this course is that sometimes um, 2 plus 2 may equal 4.5 or something, or, or 6, or something like that. Um, things change uh, depending on event, events, and people change their minds, they change their outlooks, they change their perspectives on things. History has a lot to do with how we understand uh, reality. So does culture. Um, so you have to understand facts and, and context. Uh, but you try to look at the facts as unbiased as you can. Always aware that we are biased by nature. But you have, must be self-reflective on this and try to detach yourself from your own partisan interests and look at things as scientifically as possible, knowing that um, we can't be just sort of disembodied intellects viewing reality as, as if we're looking at phenomena through um, a microscope. The difference between a biology class and, and political philosophy class is that uh, you're part of the phenomena that, that you're observing, unlike looking at an amoeba under um, a microscope. You, you, uh, you can be totally detached from that. Uh, what the amoeba does or behaves has nothing to do with you. But uh, uh, whether a, Obamacare works or not uh, is something you have an emotional commitment on one way or the other. For example, ideology uh, comes from a 18th century term uh, from the um, Enlightenment from the French philosophes, it literally means the science of ideas. They believe that all ideas could be reduced to objective reality and scientifically proven like mathematical entities. So they believe that uh, society can be governed by an objective, by objective laws of nature. Uh, the same science which enables us to understand the laws of thermodynamics or gravity or something like that can be applied to rational laws, can be applied to uh, enable us to prove that liberty exists, natural rights exist, uh, uh, justice exists. Um, all these basic principles of government can be proven scientifically. Um, so um, ideologues tend to believe that human nature in society can be studied uh, scientifically and there can be rational laws uh, derived from our, uh, from data and so therefore we can reconstruct society according to a, a rational plan it's just a, a manner of getting enough uh, data on hand getting enough facts on hand and then we can use those facts to manipulate uh, reality ideologues unlike uh, unlike uh, philosophers tend to believe that there's an end of history, that uh, there's a final uh, 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 conclusion to everything, that once we arrive at these um, scientific facts, um, 
there's no changing them. We can never go. Uh, they're true forever, just like uh, the law of gravity is. Uh, that's the difference between an ideolog and a um, philosopher. Now, the question is, as you go through this course, what do you believe? Do you think a um, that human nature is a mixture of good and evil? Do you think people are by nature a um, have a little bit of evil in them, have a little bit of good in them, and it's, and it's rooted in their very nature? Some have a little bit more of good than evil and vice versa. If, if you... Um, tend to take this dualistic view of, of human nature, then you're likely to be more comfortable with the classical Greek and Roman thinkers, with Christian think thinkers, Judeo-Christian thinkers. Uh, this is uh, traditional thought in Western civilization. But um, in um, the um, uh, 19th, uh, and the beginning in the, with the Enlightenment, uh, these ideas begin to be challenged uh, by modern thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, the utilitarian social Darwinists, who believe that people are just self-seeking egotists. We care about nothing else than um, uh, promoting our own advantage. Um, everything is about competition. Uh, everything is about getting power, uh, getting advantage on other, other people maximizing utility there's no, no such thing as a social man and we're all determined by um, uh, laws of nature uh, of behavior that are beyond our control because economic laws uh, drive us all or um, laws of social behavior drive us all uh, do you believe that people are basically good they're born good but corrupted by society then you may be a sentimental, sentimental humanitarian like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and uh, whom you'll look at later in, in a course. And um, some of the Epicurean thinkers are kind of precursors to Rousseau. Uh, they see um, man as um, basically just a pleasure seeker uh, and left to his own devices. Will do uh, good things, but, you know, uh, is corrupted by society. It's society with its class system, its inequality, its its wealth. It, it's the root of evil, with war, competition, that sort of thing. And then lastly, do you think people are mostly economic creatures, economically driven creatures? Uh, then maybe you agree with Karl Marx. Everything's about economics. All human behavior can be explained in terms of people seeking economic uh, advantage. Uh, capitalists are what they are, greedy, selfish beings that oppress the poor, and the poor what they are by nature because of the nature of the capitalist system forces them to be wage slaves to the, to the, um, to the capitalists. Um, social Darwinists uh, sort of overlap with this because they also believe that uh, people are economically driven. Everybody uh, is... Uh, driven to seek economic advantage uh, but in this case it's, it's a good thing because um, with competition comes improvement in society people are adapting to higher and higher stages of existence so where you stand on this will determine a great deal of uh, where you so where you stand on these issues that I've just described will uh, to a large extent, um, determine where you stand on um, a whole bunch of political questions. Um, if you tend to, to have one answer as a, uh, opposed to a, another, uh, you tend to favor certain kinds of ideologies. Um, um, you have preference for certain kinds of ide ideologies as opposed to others. Uh, so these are the basic assumptions that people make when they uh, argue about politics. Uh, that will end this portion of um, lecture number one, uh, the introductory lecture, and we'll now go to the ancient Greeks, which will be lecture number two. Uh, so goodbye for now.